Hi everyone, and welcome back to Think Outside the Board with me, your host, Brian Tuey. Today we're going to be talking about 22 different games. Uh, one currently running crowdfunding game, it's not a Kickstarter, so I can't say it's a Kickstarter, 11 acquired games, one game that I personally backed, and 11 games that I've played since the last video. Uh, it's been a very light month in, on crowdfunding sites because of the holidays. So this update is going to be very slanted towards the acquired and played games, of which there were a ton this uh, period. Also, I had just made a video talking about the coming changes for the channel in 2021 and what to expect. And I announced two new kinds of videos. And then as soon as I made that video, my fiance and I got into a car crash on Christmas Eve. And then on New Year's Eve, we unfortunately had to uh, put her cat to sleep, who was a lovely Maine Coon who's 16 years old. And he got, he had cancer. It's something we've been dealing with the last few months. And it had just grown so aggressive uh, that we, we had to put him to sleep on New Year's Eve. So here's a little picture of him. Uh, he's a wonderful cat. It's very sad. Uh, but anyway, that, that kind of set back my production about a week, a little less than a week. So this video is coming to you now. Uh, I've also decided to make a fourth kind of video, so that will be premiering soon. Um, I'm already kind of thinking of that in my head right now. So that'll be showing up soon. Uh, and then I have to get my seventh continent uh, play throughout. So that'll probably be the rest of this week. And then next week we'll start with all the first impressions and teach videos that I've kind of been playing a lot of games recently in, in preparation for. And I'll be talking about a lot of new games and all those videos. Please remember to like this video and subscribe. And if you want to be notified upon a publication of future videos, hit the alarm bell. And that's something you can do during the next 10 seconds as the music plays. All right, we are back with the only currently running crowdfunding game I'm going to be profiling for this period, which is January 2nd to the 22nd. Uh, it was such a light month in crowdfunding. Um, you know, it, there just hasn't been a lot going on because of holidays and end of the year stuff. And that game is actually not a Kickstarter. It is on GameFound and it is ISS Vanguard. And for those of you who don't know about this game, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of been everywhere lately. It is the next game from Awakened Realms, who did uh, Tainted Grail and Etherfields and a bunch of other things. And uh, it is a space cooperative campaign exploration game. And it's, it's pretty massive. Uh, gameplay for ISS Vanguard is going to be divided into two components. There's going to be a ship stage where players have kind of subdivided themselves on the ship. So there's kind of four areas of the ship. So when you're playing cooperatively, different players will sort of be responsible for different areas of the ship, and they will be competing with each other a little bit for uh, workers, you know, for people they're going to be controlling, and you know, they're just going to be dealing with kind of maintenance and uh, narrative choices and things like that. And then they'll be going down to planets and other, you know, meteors and these kinds of things uh, in sort of like a Star Trek you know, mission phase, doing things on the planet and then coming back to the ship. And, you know, it's this kind of massive, massive game, massive storytelling game. Uh, I, it's probably not so much for, for Euro players. It's more for people who like these big kind of narrative cooperative campaigns. And it looks a little bit like kind of a Mass Effect game, maybe meets No Man's Sky. It's a very pretty game. It has miniatures that you can kind of like add things on. It's got these binders, all these kind of books. It's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful, pretty game, and like a lot of these uh, crowdfunding campaigns for, for big games like this, there are you know, several different packages with expansions and things like that, and you can get sun drop on the miniatures. So I mean, if you go all in on this, you're looking at like a few hundred bucks. So it's not, it's not a small investment, but it is, I think when it comes out, it's going to be sort of at the top of the genre of these kind of big storytelling games, and it's promising... Uh, you know, choices that are you know, not generic, but hard choices that actually kind of affect the world of the game and the gameplay. I mean, if it achieves anywhere near what it's promising, it's going to be amazing. And uh, it's also uh, the first real 
kind of big game that's being launched on GameFound as a crowdfunding platform. GameFound had been started by Awaken Realms a couple years ago as a pledge manager system. And now Awaken Realms is trying to take that to the next level and you know, placing it as a crowdfunding competitor. And they're going to be offering this platform to other companies who want to use it maybe uh, instead of Kickstarter. So we'll have to see where that goes. Um, I think Awaken Realms maybe lost some money not going through Kickstarter. But then on the other hand, you know, they're going to be skipping a lot of Kickstarter fees going through you know, their own platform with this. So you know, maybe they'll make that up. And of course, if this takes off and it becomes another big crowdfunding platform, uh, that'll pay off for them down the line. Um, I'm not really concerned about that either way. I don't really care. We're just talking about the game here. Um, but it looks really neat to me. It's something I'm very, very interested in, and you should go take a look at it. The other thing is because of the sort of production delay I mentioned, because of the death of Thor, uh, this video is coming to you a day before the campaign ends. So if you're interested in this, you need to go out and back it immediately. <laughs> go check out the, the campaign on GameFound, watch a couple of videos, see if it's for you, but act fast. And unfortunately, that's the only game in this category. Uh, I don't have anything else that's finishing funding um, on the 22nd of January, yeah, the 22nd of January or before. I'll be doing a second January update in the third week of January, I believe, and we'll have to see how many games we have uh, crowdfunding at that time. But I anticipate there won't be that many. Um, there's a couple things that have kind of popped up, but it seems like January is going to be sort of a slow roll back to the, you know, normal Kickstarter frenzy that that it can get into in, in the middle of the year. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Anyway, we are now moving on to the section where I talk about acquired games. Sometimes I kind of hold them up, but I'm not going to do that because there are 11 of these games and it's a lot of movement that we probably don't need. So I'm going to talk about them in alphabetical order. The first game is Century Golem Edition Eastern Mountains. Now, I previously owned the Eastern Wonders version of this game. It's the, the kind of Century Spice Road theme. Uh, that was the only game that I bought in that series uh, in, in the, under the Spice theming. And I liked it a lot. I thought it was a great little game. Um, but I knew that my fiance Kristen, was going to much more um, enjoy the Gollum theming. And the reason I didn't get Eastern uh, Mountains, or the reason that I got Eastern uh, Wonders when it came out, is because the company that makes it, Plan B Games, said that they wouldn't be doing the other games in the Gollum theming. So I just kind of went and bought the game that I wanted. And then they kind of came out later and said, okay, we're going to publish these other games with the Gollum theming. So I sold my, co my copy of Eastern uh, Wonders, and I picked up... Uh, Century Gollum Edition, the first one, and then it was kind of always my t intention to pick this one up, and I have now picked it up along with Century Gollum Edition and Endless World. And I'll be talking about both of those games in the played section, as I will with a bunch of these other acquired games. So you'll hear more about it very shortly. Next up is The Crew, The Search for Planet Nine. And the reason that this is on the list is I actually caught another game that's a little lower on the list, but I'll just talk about them all now because there's a few games I kind of got together. Uh, the first one was Wasteland uh, Delivery Service, and that was a game that I've played before. I like it. It's kind of a pick-up-and-deliver set in uh, an uh, apocalyptic wasteland. Uh, it feels very, like, the art is very, like, Borderlands, if you're familiar with that video game franchise. And it's just, it's a fun pickup deliver game. Uh, but it's pretty expensive. I think the MSRP on it is like at least 70 bucks. And it showed up on a you know, daily deal sale, sale on one of the online retailers for $30. And so the price was right. And then I needed to buy a few other things to round out the cart so I could get free shipping. And so the things that I picked up with that were The Crew, The Quest for Planet Nine, which seems to be everybody's favorite card game from last year. Uh, it's a cooperative trick taker, and uh, my fiance Kristen loves card games. She loves trick taking games, and uh, she's been playing a lot of sort of Euroy games with me lately. Um, and so I wanted to get a game that 
I mean, would sort of be for her and something that would really appeal to her and something that's a little lighter that we can play when, uh, you know, we don't have the time or the headspace for some uh, huge Euro game or some big kind of campaign game, which is a lot of what we play. So I figured I'd pick up this little card game. It's easy, you know, you can take it with you different places. It's very portable and it's just cards. You know, you can play it. You can play it in bed at night. You could play it in a tent if you go camping. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to getting that one played. We haven't played it yet. Uh, but again, when I do, you'll be hearing about it and I'll be probably making some videos on it and those will probably happen very shortly. The next game I threw in the cart to reach that shipping was Dragonfire Shadows Over Dragon Spear Castle. And the reason for that purchase is that I do own the base game. Um, I have some hesitations or misgivings, I guess, about Dragonfire. Uh, and I do own a couple other kind of big campaign-y deck builders that I really, really love. Uh, Thunderstone Quest and Anne's End. But I do have Dragonfire. I'm going to get to it eventually. I picked up the second little uh, mini expansion to that one a while back on a deep sale for like three bucks. And so I figured, well, if I'm going to play the base game and I'm going to play the second little mini expansion, I should probably get the first mini expansion and make it like a complete little experience. And so... Shadows Over Dragon Spear uh, Castle was added to the cart. And then the uh, last game that was part of that purchase was Time Stories, A Prophecy of Dragons. And uh, Kristen and I played the original Time Stories base game this year. We really enjoyed it. I think I enjoyed it a little bit more because the kind of repetitive play of it was not really her thing. Um, but she still did enjoy it. And we have first expansion and the third expansion and so this was just me adding in the second expansion and I'm looking forward to playing all the expansions of Time Stories um, so that was the rest of that cart so now I'm going to jump back to the alphabetical order for the rest of this list the next game up is Excavation Earth which was on Kickstarter it's a game designed by David Turksey I haven't played this one recently but I played it on I think tabletop simulator while the Kickstarter was running I just wasn't sure if I wanted to back it at that time and I, I played it with a friend of mine um, and I, I really liked it I mean there's nothing really revolutionary happening in Excavation Earth but Turksy's just such a great designer and it's such a great collection of mechanisms that work really well together uh, the theming is essentially that players are playing different alien races and each of them has uh, different variable player powers and they're kind of going around the earth which I, I assume humankind is extinct because they're trying to acquire uh, human artifacts which are alien artifacts to them because they're aliens so they're going around the planet they're kind of digging up uh, these artifacts some of them they can buy on the black market you can trade them for money you can also uh, there's kind of a scoring mechanism where, depending on how you uh, sell them or kind of store them, it creates a, a grid of scoring opportunities for the end of the game. And then there's kind of a, an area majority thing as well. Again, I haven't played it that recently, so it's not that fresh in my mind. But I liked how all the mechanisms kind of work together, and it really felt like a solid game. It's also got really colorful, shiny art. And my playing it on TTS was the thing that kind of pushed me to back it. So I will be playing it again soon, and I'll be talking about it more once I do. Um, but I like it. It's, it's a really solid game. Then we come to Seven Bridges. And again, I've played that one, so I'll be talking about it later in the played section. But that was sort of a roll and write that was on Kickstarter using a, a cartographer's map of, uh, I think it's called Konigsberg is the city. Um, and it's a roll and write. And I'll... I'll Again, I'll talk to that. I'll talk more about that very, very soon. And the next game up is Unmatched Cobble and Fog, which I will be talking about in the played game section. Also, Waste Nights, second edition, which I'll be talking about in the played section, and Whistle Mountain by Scott Caputo and Luke Laurie, which I will also be talking about in the played section. So those are all of the games that I've acquired in the last few weeks. Now, there's only one game for me to talk about in the pledge section, and that is Vindication Board Game and Chronicles Expansion. And this was a Kickstarter. Uh, I own the original uh, game Vindication. I also own the Leaders and Alliances expansion. 
it's a great, very uh, pretty sort of point salad game where there's all these different ways that you can score points. And I love games like that. It gives you an opportunity if one of your strategies isn't really working out for you, you can kind of change tactics and do other things. And I really like games that allow you the ability to do that, to kind of move and adjust with what's happening in the game and with what you and other players are doing and kind of you know, what's coming to you. And there's so many mechanisms and so much stuff in this game. Uh, it, it's just, it's great. And this is more stuff, more stuff for the game. Um, the first thing is the Chronicles expansion, which kind of adds more of a narrative element to the game. Now, this has never been like a campaign game. It has a very kind of narrative feel to it. Players are playing characters that are scumbags and they've washed up on this island and they're looking for their redemption or, as you may have it, vindication. And so they're kind of going around the island and they're doing various things to, I guess, redeem themselves. Uh, so there's kind of this narrative element to it, but the game almost looks abstract. It's very pretty. There's kind of tiles, there's cards, there's all these kind of ways to score points. So it's not, it's not a narrative exploration game. It's not a campaign game. It's not, yeah, but it's got this narrative theming to it. And I think that maybe Orange Nebula thought that that kind of narrative theming wasn't strong enough because of all the other stuff. So Chronicles expansion adds more of a narrative element to it. It gives you the things that you can kind of do between between turns, like while other players are, are taking their turns on a, on a spreadsheet and ways to kind of flesh out your character and give them more narrative depth uh, in ways that will affect the, the game, the ongoing gameplay. Um, also through this Kickstarter, you can get the uh, Odyssey module expansion and the kind of big neoprene mat. That was a bundle that Orange Nebula did kind of around the holidays, and it was through their, uh, their website. But they also made it available through this Kickstarter campaign. So you were able to get that through this Kickstarter campaign as well. And then, and then at the very, like the 11th hour, they added on another expansion called Villages and Hamlets, which adds on kind of even more, even more gameplay. But I just, I love Vindication. I think it's a great game. I like the way it's designed. It's beautiful. I'm quickly becoming a very huge fan of Orange Nebula. Um, I'm very much looking forward to Unsettled, uh, which is their kind of space game that comes out later in this, in the year. It's a, it was a Kickstarter project last year. It's slated to deliver, well, who knows now with all the shipping delays, but soonish in the next few months. And that is probably the other space game that I'm really excited about for 2021, in addition to ISS Vanguard. Although ISS Vanguard, I don't think it's going to be delivering until the following year. But right now, those are kind of the, the two big space games I'm really excited about. So, yeah, this was the, the one campaign that I backed in, uh, in late December. Vindication. Chronicles. Expansion. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about the games that I played this period. Um, and there's 11 of these, and a lot of them were the arrived games, because I'm playing a lot of these games in preparation to produce a bunch of first impressions videos that you're going to be seeing on this channel very, very soon, next week, kind of appearing in mass. Uh, I'm planning on getting at least four of these videos made each week. So I'm kind of like, I've been playing a bunch of games in preparation for that, kind of front-loading my games. Anyway, the first one is Let's go back now. Century Golem Edition, Eastern Mountains. And as I said, I owned the previous version, Eastern Wonders, before. Uh, I really like the game. It's a pick-up-and-deliver game. It uses a lot of the mechanics from Spice Road. Uh, there's tiles that kind of go on the board. And in, in the original spice theme game, you've got little player ships. And you kind of move around the board with them. You can take a certain amount of movement, and then you... Pay, uh, cubes to move more and you're going to different uh, locations you're building houses on them once you've got a house on a location or a trading post I guess you can then do the kind of conversion action on that tile which allows you to well sometimes it's a conversion sometimes you're just getting cubes but sometimes you're converting cubes that you already have or upgrading them but it's it's a resource management kind of cube game and then when you have certain types of uh, cubes or gems, I think really in the uh, Golem Edition, it's all gems, which is part of the reason why the Golem Edition is better because the gems are really tactile and pretty. Um, but once you get certain 
gems, you can go to the tiles on the four corners of the board and exchange them for those kind of end game scoring point tiles. So you know, there's a few different mechanisms going on in the game. And the Century games also have this very, very uh, interesting variant thing where not only can you play each of the three games, but you can play them with each other. You can take any two games and put them together for a variant, or you can take all three games and put them together for a variant. So between the three games, you actually have seven different games that you can play. And I personally have not gotten into the variants yet, you know, the games where you're pushing things together, but I'm excited to do that. Now I'm going to start talking about uh, an endless world as well at the same time here, because I, I really, really do like uh, Eastern Wonders um, or Eastern Mountains in this case. I, th I think I actually prefer Eastern Wonders a little bit because I like the theming of the ships moving around. In, uh, in Eastern Mountains, you kind of have wagons that are moving around mountains. So, I mean, it's, it's inconsequential, but in my mind, I just like the ship idea a little bit better than the wagons. However, the Gollum theming is going to win every day for me because the gems are nicer than just cubes, and the card art for the Gollums is awesome. It's just cute. It's really pretty. Um, and I would very, very much recommend to you um, the second game, the pick up and deliver one, Eastern Wonders or Eastern Mountains. And uh, the first game in the series is good too. It's sort of a simple kind of deck construction hand management game. An Endless World, in my opinion, is the weakest of the three games. I don't, I don't really think it's a keeper. Um, it's very similar to the second game, but instead of pick up and deliver, you're doing worker placement. So it's got a lot of the same kind of card mechanisms with upgrading cubes, uh, just getting cubes um, or kind of exchanging some cubes for others. But at the end of the day, that's being paired in Endless World with worker placement. And the worker placement in that game is so simple to me. And there are so many good worker placement games out there that I think it's just, it's at the bottom of my worker placement games in my collection. Um, almost any of the others I would probably pick up and play first. So I have a feeling... I may end up sell selling an Endless World, but I think what's going to really make that decision will be the, the combined games. I'm gonna, I need to see how an Endless World plays with um, Century Golem Edition and how it plays with uh, Eastern Mountains and how it plays with all three games together. If I feel like those variants are good, I'll keep it. But if it's just a case of like you know the standalone games, to me, Eastern Mountains slash Eastern Wonders is a keeper, and an Endless World is not. It's just there are too many good, better worker placement games out there. Next up on the list is Chronicles of Crime 1400. It's the latest game in the Chronicles of Crime series. It was part of the Kickstarter last year uh, called the Millennium Trilogy, where they have three different games in three different time periods, and then a fourth game that kind of spans the time periods. So I think, I think you do need the other three games to play the fourth game. Um, but as a Kickstarter, you could get all of them together and there's kind of a box for everything to go in. Uh, a little too many boxes for my taste because it meant that the other four boxes that it came with, you're just sort of getting rid of, which I'm not a huge fan of. You know, just don't send me those boxes. Just send me everything in the, in the, in the, uh, the collected box. Um, anyway... There is only app support currently for the first game, which is 1400. So the other games, 1900 and 2400, are waiting on the app support. And this is a game where you do need an app to play. It's uh, you're going to be scanning, you're going to be scanning QR codes. That's basically the gameplay. Um, it's got a beautiful, uh, big kind of neoprene mat. If you have that, it also has beautiful cards. Um, just, just really, really spectacular art. And you essentially are a detective, and you are investigating various crimes. And it's one of these games where the game comes with, I think it's five scenarios. I think there were four plus kind of a Kickstarter stretch goal scenario. So I believe each of the three games has five scenarios. And I've played the first three. Well, one of them is a tutorial. So I've played the tutorial and then the first two cases, and I think there's two more. And I really like it. I think... It's smartly designed, 
and the dialogue is really well written. Everything about it is very well written. It's it's a joy to play, and it's a beautiful game. Um, it's some people may not like the time period as much. I know people have played kind of like the original version, uh, like certain things about that. I think maybe fourteen hundred is sort of the least anticipated of these. Uh, expansions. Um, there, 1900 is coming out, and then there's going to be 2400. 2400 is kind of like cyberpunk themed. You're playing a character in all three games of the same familial lineage. So, yeah, the relatives, and each one solves crimes. And then the fourth game kind of links them all together. Um, so they're beautiful games. The one caveat here, though, is you are solving cases. So once you've solved the case and you know the answers to it, you, the replay value is gone. You, you can't replay it. So when you're considering buying this uh, or you know whatnot, you need to know that it, it, it's a one-time experience for the most part, but it's a good experience. It's a very good experience. And for my money, for a lot of these games that I've played, uh, it's one of the best written. Okay, the next game on my list is Detective City of Angels, which is another of these games with uh, certain cases, and once you solve them and you know the answers, you're kind of done playing that game. Mostly. And the reason I say mostly for uh, Detective City of Angels is that there are several ways to play the game. You can play cooperatively, sort of all these detectives playing against the game itself, and there's a way to kind of do that. Um, you can play competitively as well. Um, but the game is supposed to really shine when you play it with a character who takes on the role of the chisel, which is kind of like a dungeon master um, role. And that character will be interacting with the detectives and trying to subtly sabotage them and prevent them from solving the case. So there's ways that the chisel can um, answer questions a little bit incorrectly or try to throw detectives off. And that is supposed to be kind of where the game shines and that's how it's designed to be played. However, we are in a global pandemic right now. Everybody who is sane is socially distancing. So my gameplay experience right now is really just me uh, and my fiance Kristen. But there is a way to play this game without that kind of uh, third-person role. And that is to play kind of cooperatively against the game. Um, and it's, I don't think it's supposed to be quite as exciting, um, but it's playable. And it's a good game. And like Chronicles of Crime, the cases that I've seen so far are very well written. And also both of these games have a great sense of humor about them. You know, there's murders and things that are happening, but the writing is not one note. You know, the writing is very, like there's humor. Sometimes it's sick humor, um, but there's humor kind of in odd places and it feels very real and fleshed out. And uh, Detective City of Angels also takes place on a big board that is uh, used from a historical map of uh, Los Angeles around that time. And it's got a lot of flavor. and. The art in the game is just great. It's Vincent Dutre who did the art. Uh, so he did the art kind of like for the little character tiles and the cards and stuff. And uh, I think someone else did the board art. But the art across the board for Detective City of Angels is fantastic. And once you play the cases, you know, if someone else is playing the chisel character, or if you're playing kind of cooperatively against the game without the chisel, once you play the cases, you know the answers. So you can't play again as a detective. But you can play as that chisel character. And actually, I've got uh, two of the expansions up here for it. I think the base, the base game is down there on a different shelf. Um, but I have a lot, so between all this, I have quite a few cases, right? And I, it's a game that I really, really look forward to uh, bringing to one of my game groups when you know vaccines are kind of more widely available and people are not having to socially distance anymore. Because I think with a with a, uh, a game group and then someone, you know, running it as the chisel who kind of knows the case, it's just going to be a hell of a lot of fun. And uh, I can't wait to be able to play it um, in under that setting. So I think I may play a couple more cases with my fiance. And then when I, you know, bring it into my game group, I'll be playing the role of ch the chisel playing those cases. But I'd like to be able to play some cases as a detective with another person playing the chisel. So hopefully if it's a hit with you know one of my game groups, um, one of the players can eventually take the role of chisel for a couple of games. But it's a really good game. I, I very much would recommend it if you like those kinds of like uh, cooperative games 
um, or like a one versus many and just kind of fun uh, fun interactions at the table and a good table presence as well. That brings us to Dwellings of Eldervale, which is huge right now, right? I mean, everybody is talking about this game. It's on everyone's top 10 list. There's a lot of number ones for this game, and uh, I liked it. I liked the game a lot. It's very shiny. Um, if you got the Legendary Edition on Kickstarter, you've got these kind of monsters with bases that make sounds. Uh, it's from Breaking Games. Um, although, I, I rather than Breaking Games, I would say it's from Peter Vaughn. Because Peter Vaughn, this is his baby, he kind of produced it, and he is no longer at uh, Breaking Games. He's now Cardboard Alchemy. So I would encourage everybody to pay a lot of attention to Cardboard Alchemy. I think uh, I think the kind of game that that uh, Dwellings is is going to be what Cardboard Alchemy is producing in the future, more so than Breaking Games, uh, because Dwellings of Elder Bale is very much a Peter Vaughn production. It's also very much a Luke Lorry production because he's the he's the actual designer behind it, and um, it's a it's a very interestingly designed game. It's not if you're looking for kind of a pure uh, you know, efficiency, no luck Euro, you're going to be out of luck. <laughs> there is dice rolling in uh, Dwellings of Elder Vale. And so some kind of heavier Euro gamers may write the game off because of that. And, and I understand that. I don't always like a lot of luck in games, especially when it doesn't go my way. But there are ways in this game to minimize that luck. And there are ways to kind of very strategically uh, play the game so that you can you know, minimize that luck and, and kind of push things to your advantage. So I don't think those those gamers need to completely write this game off. In fact, I think it's such a pretty game. It's got such a great table presence. It's got some you know, kind of cool mechanics and interesting ideas behind it. I think everybody should try to play this game at least once or twice. Um, but, but yeah, I could see how some gamers might just kind of write it off because of the luck factor. And I'm going to be making some videos on this game soon, so I'll be talking more about it there, but I don't think there's a you know reason to kind of cast it aside uh, for heavier gamers. I think there's ways that they can very much enjoy it as well. Uh, it, it's, it's a really fun game, so it, has, it definitely has my uh, recommendation behind it. Then that brings us to Last Aurora, and I think this might be a game that people don't know about as much. Uh, it was also a Kickstarter. Uh, it is also apocalypse themed, but it takes place in a frozen apocalypse, like a frozen tundra. And basically the players are sort of different factions and they're kind of racing across this tundra to make it to the ship called Aurora, which is an icebreaker ship. And it's basically the only way for people to get out of this kind of increasingly icy tundra. So an icebreaker ship is what it sounds like, right? It can go through ice and kind of break it. So players are trying to kind of race across this tundra, uh, and it's it's a very Euro-y game. There's kind of like card, there's a card tableau going on where you're building up um, like your convoy, and you can add weapons to the top of it. You can make it longer. You can kind of, uh, you know, add on to the end of the tableau and you're carrying people and kind of goods and you're going to be fighting enemies that appear as you're doing this race across the tundra. Um, it's a very, very interesting combination of, you know, kind of Euro efficiency puzzle while also having this kind of card combat in it and being thematic. I think a lot of times uh, games do one or the other, right? They're either, they're, they're very kind of puzzly and tight or they're very thematic and maybe luck-based and, you know, Ameritrash, right? But this game kind of finds a good, a really good middle. And I don't think this is a game that a lot of people know about or are playing. And it, it, it's good. It's good in a lot of ways. So it's not, it's not the best game I've played recently because I've played a lot of good games. But it's a solid game and I think it deserves more attention than it's getting. And it, it's, it's a lot of fun. It, it's really fun. There's still a chance it might make it onto my uh, top 10 for 2020 list, which I will be producing. Uh, in the next couple months. I'll probably be more like a top 20, in which case, yeah, maybe it'll make it on. Well, we'll see. But it's it's a solid game. That brings us to Rococo Deluxe Edition. And, oh, this is such a good game. <laughs> it, 
it, there's an amazing production value behind this reprint. Um, the original game was a beautiful game. It had beautiful art. It probably didn't need new art. But this new game has art and graphic design by Ian O'Toole, who's perhaps my favorite artist of all time. And it is also gorgeous. And not only that, it has a lot of the deluxe components. The spool threads and the lace in this game are just really, really neat. These kind of very tactile, almost kind of miniature little resources. And everything about the game is just, it's beautiful. Uh, this is a game where you are playing... Um, tailors, I guess, in the court of uh, King Louis XIV, and you are trying to make dresses and court frocks for people. You're competing for different resources and different employees, and it's a hand management game. It's a deck construction game. There's a really cool element to the, uh, I'm not going to call it deck building. I think it's more deck construction, and the reason is how that works, which is that um, when you get cards, first of all, if you buy a card, uh, during your turn, that card goes directly in your hand and you're going to get to use it during that round, which is a little different than other deck building games, usually where it goes into your discard and then it has to kind of cycle into your draw pile and then into your hand. So buying employees is a way for you to get additional actions on your turn. And uh, the other sort of unique thing about it is when you are drawing cards from your draw pile, you get to look through your entire draw pile and select the three cards that you're going to use uh, for that upcoming round, which is really, really interesting, right? To have that kind of choice and not have the cards coming to you somewhat randomly. Um, I like it. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, the card mechanics in some way feel a little bit like Concordia to me, I guess, uh, in the way that it's not, you know, kind of pure standard deck building. But I, I really like that, the deck construction of Rococo. And then the theming is awesome. I mean, the the board is very, very pretty. There's a lot of pastel colors, and I love the kind of making dress themes of it, and the frock coats. And then from there, it's kind of an area um, majority game. When you're making dresses, you can just sell them for money, you know, if you need money. But other than that, you're going to be placing them on the board in certain areas, and then at the end of the game, they'll score area majorities, you know, you know based, on, based on who has more dresses in each kind of like of the five rooms of the game and there's a lot more to it than that there's uh, several different kind of scoring mechanisms there's a few uh, mini expansions that are built into this version and there's also the bigger jewelry box expansion this game just has everything that was available for the uh, previous game like all the little things all baked in and it's just it's a wonderful game the production value for it is off the charts if you know Eagle Griffin and you've seen their kind of big box Lacerda games, which is most of the Lacerda games, uh, Vinhos Deluxe, The Gallerist, Escape Plan, On Mars, Lisboa, they all come in these big boxes and their production value is just off the charts. And Rococo is similar. Like it is the same box size. It is the same production value. It's just a gorgeous game. And the fact that Eno Tool is doing the art makes it almost feel like a Lacerdo, but it's not. It's designed by Louis and Stefan Maltz and Matthias Kramer. And this is just, it's a great game. I mean, I got highest recommendation on this one. Okay, that brings us to Seven Bridges, which unfortunately I have to say is my least favorite game I've played in a while. Uh, it's a roll and write, it was on Kickstarter. My fiance, there was a time in her life where she really considered a career in architecture. She's also uh, German, and I thought the fact that, you know, this is sort of set in a German city, it's the map that it's, you're, you're kind of using for the role and write actions is based on a cartographer's map of Konigsberg. Um, and it was a little bit of a chance, me backing this one, uh, but it wasn't expensive. I think it was like $29 for this game. It just it's fell really flat to me. I mean, the I feel like the choices and the actions that you're taking are just not very fun. And I haven't played that many roll and writes. Um, I have played Welcome To, which I guess is like a flip and write. And I've played Cartographers. And both of those games are so much fun. Like, there's so much joy when you're playing those games and just taking the actions and kind of filling out your player sheets. It's, they're just, they're both pure joy. Seven Bridges is a drag, man. And uh, 
you know, I feel bad saying it. I don't want to harsh on games really ever, but it just, it wasn't for me. Um, and it wasn't for my fiance and she seemed so predisposed, to, you know, towards it because of her, you know, her history and, and the German thing and the architecture thing. So I don't know who out there is going to like this game if, if she doesn't, um, but maybe someone will, but it is not, it is not a, a game that's going to come with a high recommendation from me. That brings us to Unmatched Cobble and Fog. And I'm a little behind the curve on this one. This is my first play of an unmatched game. And these games are on fire right now. Everyone seems to love them. And I see why. Because uh, you get a certain number of kind of characters. And they all have kind of variable player powers. Some of them come with um, sidekicks. Some of them don't. Some of them come with other weird little mechanisms. Uh, essentially, it's a fighting game. So you're moving around the board, uh, but you're also using kind of a deck building mechanic and each character comes with their own private deck. And the cards in it are so cool and so thematic. And uh, Cobble and Fog comes with the Invisible Man and Dracula and Sherlock Holmes. And I think I'm blanking on, oh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is actually the character that I played. And uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is pretty cool. Like I think like they're actually the least cool of the bunch but it's still really cool. So as you're going around um, with Jekyll and Hyde, you can transform back and forth and you kind of want to be transforming into Hyde to attack because Hyde has really powerful attacks and then transforming back to Jekyll to kind of move around the board because you don't want to be Hyde when you're moving around the board. He, he sort of has some um, weaknesses doing that. But it's a very tactics-minded game. Um, it is just, you know, one-on-one -on -one fighting and that means that my fiance didn't really like it because she doesn't really like direct combat games so i don't think i'm going to be playing it again with her just because there's no fun for her in it but i think the game is insanely fun and it's definitely a keeper for me and i can't wait to play it with other people who do like this kind of game and there are, you know, this is, uh, Cobble and Fog is kind of a standalone base game. You can also get the original, uh, I think it's just Unmatched Volume 1, maybe. And then there are kind of a lot of expansion packs as well, so you can kind of get a lot of different characters. And it's, it's not a big game. There's a board, but it's relatively small. And then it's all cards from there. Uh, you do have miniatures, you know, and uh, some other things. The game tray for it is so neat. Um, it's just, it's very elegant and simple at the same time. Everything goes in a very specific place. It just fits so easily and nicely in this. I think even though there's a board for this, uh, you can almost use it as a travel game. And um, it just, it depends if you have enough space to set up that board. Um, but it's it's a great game. And it's very heavily thematic. And for anyone who likes fighting games, I think this is one of the best out there. There's just so many opportunities for, um, you know, customization from character to character and the kind of way you play it. And there's also kind of a, a little bit of a puzzle learning how to play the character and play to their strengths and their abilities. It's just, it's a pure fun game. Um, also, the games are fairly short, probably like 15 or 20 minutes with people who know how to play the game. So it's quick and it's just, it's just pure joy. It's great. <laughs> All right. Um, that brings us to Waste Nights Second Edition. And this is another game that I don't think too many people know about. Um, there was a first edition, which I'm not even sure if it was released in the United States. Um, but this is being billed by the company that makes it Galacta, yeah, Galacta, as a Polar Trash, Australia Trash game. So Waste Nights is essentially a, an RPG in a box. Um, you're going to have miniatures, you're playing on a board, uh, but a lot of what you're doing is, you know, reading through kind of a narrative book and making choose your own choices. Those choices are going to be different. Um, sometimes different characters have different choices. Um, you're rolling dice to do complete certain tests based on skills. You're also going to be moving around the board, and there's kind of some resource management going on with that. Um, and there's going to be combat in the game. Oh, and then also, like RPGs, you get to upgrade your character and advance them and get um, you know, better cards and kind of skill upgrades and things like that. Uh, it's it's very, very thematic, and again, I think there are a few problems in the writing of the game. There are some kind of grammar errors in some of the writing, um, 
It's a bit of a translation issue, I think. Um, and it's a very text heavy game, obviously. But that part aside, the writing of the game is super sharp. Like, again, it's, it's not one note. It's very three dimensional. There's so much kind of theme in this game. The world that it's building, you just, you feel it all around you. There's also um, kind of a sick sense of humor, sometimes in the dialogue and things that happen, but also in the art. Um, you know, there'll be things like, um, there's like dog, robot dogs with lasers. And there's a, my fiance laughed when I think it was some kind of like a mutant kangaroos came out. But it, it's a really, really fun game to play. Uh, I think it has five cooperative scenarios, including some Kickstarter. I think one or two of them were kind of Kickstarter bonuses. There's also a solo scenario and there are two competitive scenarios. But a lot of these scenarios are massive. Um, so a scenario could end up being like maybe three games worth of gameplay. So if you play a whole scenario at once, it could take you hours. I mean, hours. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in the game. And also in scenarios, they're kind of broken up into sections. And you may be playing different sections depending on your choices. So it's very, very possible to play a scenario and go through like five different subsections of the scenario and play different ones each time. I mean, they'll mix and match them, but it's possible for you to play like all of one set of, of choices and then go through it and make totally different choices and not even be playing any of the same game in that same scenario. I wish there was more to it um, a little bit. Like I wish there were more scenarios but the scenarios are so meaty and there's so much um, division in, in how you play them and what happens that I think that there is enough in this game for it to be a keeper. And I'm not saying that lightly because I think a lot of games you can run through the scenarios very quickly and then get to that point where you're thinking, yeah, I can play other characters, but I'm essentially doing the same things and the choices are not that different. And, uh, you know, it, it can kind of run that gauntlet very quickly and, and the game can kind of get tired. I think there's kind of enough variation in this one that, and again, with, with kind of the, the length of the scenarios and the meatiness of them, that I think, you know, if you play everything and you set it aside a little bit and you come back and you play different characters and you make different choices, you may not even recognize the scenario that much. So, so there is a lot of replay value in this. Also in the Kickstarter, there were several other modules, um, two of which made the game a little bit longer and easier. One of, one of those also made it more complex. So maybe if you want a little more kind of Euro complexity, you can throw that module in. And then there was a third module that makes the game more difficult. I can tell you after playing the first cooperative scenario, we definitely didn't need it to be more difficult. I also played the solo scenario by myself, and I I beat that one. Um, that was a pretty easy one. Um, so, it, I mean, it's not impossible to win things, but it, it can get very difficult at times. Again, I think there's enough variability in the game and stuff that it, it doesn't bother me if I lose a scenario in this game because I want to play it again. It, it's, it's really good. Uh, again, it's like an RPG in a box, so... You know, it is very heavy on narrative and theme and uh, kind of these choose your own choices. So whether or not you enjoy that kind of game will determine whether or not you like this one. But for people who like this, take a look at it. And I think it may be off a lot of people's radar just because I don't know too many other people that know about it or talking about it, but it, it's good. And finally, the last game played this period is Whistle Mountain, uh, which makes two games by Luke Laurie. The first one being Dwellings of Eldervale, and this one he uh, co-designed with Scott Caputo. I did a little write-up on my Facebook page, on my personal Facebook page, and I mentioned, I think I said it was fiddly, fiddly, fiddly. And uh, Luke Laurie, <laughs> Laurie is actually on my friends list, and he saw that, and I, I felt a little bad because, uh, well, it is fiddly. It's a very fiddly game, but it's also an amazing game great game and there's a lot going on in, in Whistle Mountain um, players control airships and th these are kind of worker placement uh, units and you can place them around the edges of the board to get resources and you know various things and then 
players are going to be building scaffolding on this kind of huge water reservoir. And as they build scaffolding, they're also going to be then placing machines that they're building on the scaffolding and placing workers on the scaffolding. And so in addition to using these kind of, and when I say workers, I mean people. So you're going to have workers, which are people that are getting placed on the scaffolding and you're trying to kind of like move them over to the side to score end game points. And those workers are different from the airship workers, which are the workers that you're actually placing around the board for resources. Or as you build these machines and scaffolding comes out with resources on it, you can place them adjacent to those machines and resources to trigger those machines, which sometimes do really cool things, and to get the resources from the scaffolding. And there are a lot of tiles in this game. Um, there are tiles for three different sizes of these machines. There are tiles uh, that, you, that come out that you can kind of plug into your player mats that give you all of these uh, variable player powers. There's also a big uh, player ability thing that you start the game with. So right from the top, you're gonna have kind of your own variable player ability. But then as you buy these kind of six other gears and slot them into your player boards, it's gonna build an engine, a variable player engine that's gonna allow you to do different things from other players and kind of chain your actions together in unique ways. And between all of the you know, worker placement spots around the edges of the board and the machines on the board and your player mats, there's just so much variability. It's, it's, a, it's an efficiency puzzle for sure. And it's a heavier Euro game. I think I put it in the medium heavy section. Um, and then on top of all this, as you're building these kind of machines and the scaffolding, this reservoir is going to slowly start to fill up. And there's this very, very weird little plastic hook thing that goes into the board. The board itself comes in four pieces and you kind of like assemble it each game. And some of the parts of the board have these kind of grooves cut out through them. So you'll place these plastic hooks into the grooves and then you'll put all these like long water bar tiles in there. So you've got these workers who are in this kind of reservoir running around on scaffolding and doing things. And then as the scaffolding gets built to certain heights, you're going to be placing uh, these long water bar, bar tiles in such a way that it indicates like a rising tide, like rising water levels in this reservoir. And if workers are on those spaces as those tides, tides rise, they're going to fall off and go into a whirlpool. And then it's up to you, you know, some of the actions you can do are saving these workers from the whirlpool. Um, and if any of them are left in the whirlpool at the end of the game, each of them is worth a negative five victory points. But this is one of those games where there are just so many different kind of strategies and ways to score points. And a lot of what you're going to be doing each game is going to uh, be tweaked by the different tiles that come out and the way you've built your engine and how your strategy is working out and what your opponent is doing. Uh, just endless replayability for a game like this, as long as you like that central gameplay loop. So uh, that was a great game. Um, I really, really enjoyed Whistle Mountain, and I'm actually going to be producing, I've decided recently, uh, kind of a game of the month video, in which I'll talk about the games that I thought were the best of the previous month. So I'm shortly going to be producing a uh, you know, sort of January 2020 game of the month video, and Whistle Mountain will be on there for sure. So you can look forward to that. But that's how much I like the game. It's really, really good. And uh, I think there's no doubt that that one will show up on my my you know, top 10 or 20 list when I eventually you know, finish playing the games I need to play in 2020 and, and, and get to producing it. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this video. I'm trying to keep these under an hour so they're a little more digestible. But there was 22 games that I wanted to talk about. Actually, I guess it wasn't really 22 games because there are a lot of uh, crossovers between the acquired games and the played games. So once again, thank you. Uh, please like and subscribe. I really need to grow the channel right now, and that's the kind of easiest and best and quickest way for me to do that. So you're doing that really, really helps me out. If you enjoyed the video, hopefully that gives you a good reason to do so. I will be back very shortly with my January 2020 games of the month, as well as a Seventh Continent uh, playthrough that I keep hyping. And then starting next week, you're going to see a lot of really cool first impressions videos and teaching review videos start to
come out in, in, in mad volume. So be looking out for those. See you next time.